Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. As usual, let us begin our Dharma talk today with the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times, please. Om Nam. 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 Thank you very much. I appreciate Ma's wonderful introductory. Some points became very clear. For instance, that time and space are relative. Also, it became clear that time and space depend on our mind. Many times they ask us practitioners, how does Zen really work? And in Zen, we don't talk about our direct meditation experiences because it can lead to misdirected practice. Life experience, as you heard, during work, family relations, dealing with emotions, dealing with thinking, that's very useful. It demonstrates how the mind can create time. We can also create space. There are very few ground rules in Zen, but one is, if you make it, you have it. If you don't make it, you don't have it. It's true about any of your thoughts, feelings, impulses, forms of consciousness. So how does this really work? To give you an example of today, I went through an interesting emergency situation. Usually I do not oversleep, but when I travel a lot, fatigue accumulates, and even though I set two independent alarms, I overrode both of them. And I cut really close, even with the original setting. But this morning I was 20 minutes late and I had to make a choice not to miss the flight. I woke up somebody in the temple, please take me to the airport instead of leaving the car at a third party parking agency, we would use this option. But the person couldn't drive and I had no one else around. I had no time to search. And when you have this emergency, usually your mind explodes into options. These options are necessary to alleviate the crisis. Now, if your mind is too noisy and you are attached to this multitude of options appearing and disappearing, you are rendered totally incapable. You cannot act. You cannot do it. I just sat in the car studied it up, and in the frosty, cold, foggy morning, I broke the speed record of any vehicle <laughs> on the riverbank from north to south at 4.30 a.m. I passed a few deer and a four-legged mammal, you know, stayed alive, and everybody was fine. However, I realized something that if I kept the original arrangement, I would miss the flight. But inside the mind, there was this very clear, intuitive blip, keep to the plan. So how do I keep to the plan without missing the flight? I was still delayed. I called the company. The company offered to pick the car at the terminal instead of the parking place, which is like a 10, 15 minute ride away. So they solved it for me. This is what you don't know in times of crisis. And any kind of dualistic mind is the wrong choice. And if you have the meditative experience, you can keep your mind space open. That means you're capable of acting, speaking, finding the solution. 
But if you are ziplocked into your own crisis, then this mind chatter, the multitude of options do not bring you any results because you don't know how to choose. And we call this function reflection or insight. When your mind spontaneously, intuitively chooses the right thing. I could have woken up someone else who was living nearby, outside of the temple. I could have gone to the VIP parking and instruct people to pick up the car later with the secondary key. And all these things are whizzing through your mind while you are going at that very high speed on the foggy riverbank, sparing all, all lives as you progress. And by the time we reached the five o'clock mark, I was still 30 kilometers away from the airport. And that's when I made the call. That's when the guys started to line up. At 5.20, I hit the airport terminal. They took the car, and I was way within my limits because we could cut back on the time loss. I actually gained the time compared to the original schedule. That's how the mind can work. So don't lose the moment, because if I lost the moment, I would have been splattered in various points of time and space where I should be, when I should be, with whom I should be, who can help me, etc. That's when we say only go straight, keep the moment clear. And if you keep the moment clear, your intuition can broadcast the signal. We all have intuitive function. We all have the mind that can wake up. But if you don't practice this intuitive uh, function, then in critical situations, you can't make it. You can't manage it because you are not used to conflicts. You're not used to crises. Now, especially in this part of the world, our lives are so well padded as if it was made against conflicts. It was just totally shunning encounters, ruling out crises before they would ever occur. And that's why I'm very grateful that Zen Master Sung San taught us Kongan practice. Kongans are question and answer sessions between teacher and student based on stories that have paradoxical nature from China, from Korea, from the Buddha's time, from Bodhidharma's time. And these stories teach you how to use your thinking, how to keep your mind space open, how to keep a clear mirror consciousness, whatever happens, not to fall into dualities, not to be lost in your own options, always having a clear hierarchy inside. And then your situation is clear, your relationship is clear, and your function is clear. We can all learn that. How? First, we have to unlearn our habitual tendencies that would be the hindrance before this. And that's why we meditate. During meditation, we can really perceive what's going on inside. That perception is step one. Next, how to use that in an adverse situation. Something that you cannot fathom, you cannot intellectually model, or emotionally hard to endure. Some kongans are even hard to read because there's such emotion content in there. This takes time, this takes effort, and it doesn't provide you with instant gratification, which also the consumer world wants. Eventually, when you lay down the groundwork and you build a new house, then you can move into that. So when you start practicing, maybe for some time you don't notice significant changes. Why? Because it goes to your subconscious. It's like you want a bag of fruit, but in the market, the vendor tells you that actually you have to plant a tree first. So when you want fruit, you don't really logically start to dig a hole in the ground and put a tree, a sapling into that hole. But that's how we begin. And then the tree grows, becomes strong, turns into fruition, and then you can pick the fruit. Most people are not ready to walk the miles. But as you heard from miles, you can walk that distance. This is really important because if we don't make significant changes within ourselves, then our world doesn't change. We seem to be always busy, always in the usual entropy of our own broadcast, believing our narrative as the only reality that we have. And the Buddha's teaching and the patriarchs subsequently, they showed that you don't have to believe this. You don't have to be caught up in your own karma. You don't have to follow your own personal hurricane to make landfall into reality and somehow sustain damage. 
So in times of crises, the teaching shows its value. Also in peacetime, Buddhism doesn't explicitly tell you what happiness is. Rather, we would take away the hindrance before happiness. Same as loving kindness, same as wisdom, we don't explicitly tell you what that is. Because moment to moment, if your mind is clear, you can realize that, you can attain that. But we do know what the hindrance is. We call that suffering. That suffering is something we endure and we also cause. And this fact of suffering is something so obvious that no human being can possibly deny that or elude that for a long time. And if we acknowledge the fact of suffering, we can see the cause of it, we can see the end of it, and we can progress on the path to end it. And if you listen carefully, then this was the Four Noble Truths. That's the basic teaching of Buddha Shakyamuni, how he began. And you can see the summary, and also the exposition, in the Lotus Sutra. It's an important point in the Buddha's teaching, because he started out with these basic facts that if you make something in your mind, you have that. And if you don't make something in your mind, you don't have that. But most people, even at that time, did not understand it right away. So he split it up into four very clear relationships of cause and effect. If you're missing something, that means you haven't used your creativity. If you have something or someone in your life that you don't want, it means you're attached to some idea and that renders you helpless. So if you don't have something, you can create that. And if you have something really unnecessary, you can do away with that. It's our basic human potential. So I wish we would use that very clearly with compassion and wisdom. If we don't, we suffer. Actively or passively, we do. Reverse the equation. If you experience suffering, then you haven't accessed your true nature. You haven't used your human potential. You haven't gone beyond dualities, and you haven't spoken, acted, thought, and felt clearly. Then we are deluded. So no one can blame another person or the world for his or her own karma. And the moment we stop doing that, we actually get down to business. We acknowledge life on earth as we live it, and start from there. I took this body when I was born. No one else did. I brought my karma in my backpack. No one else did. I chose my parents and they accepted me. No one else did. This is the continuation of all my previous lives. And that's for a fact, very clearly. There's no one to blame for who I am. There's no one to blame for the life that I'm living. And once we acknowledge that, we can change that if we don't want this. But before that, we are looking for the causes in the wrong place. We are like blind people in the snowstorm. And for this Zen, which is direct insight into existence, directly and clearly attaining our true nature, that's one of those paths where we can alleviate all this suffering, where we can actually attain happiness and then leave this world in a better shape than we found it. So now, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I have a question about hard working. In my experience, life is in two sides. There is hard work physically, and there is when you put effort in the growing of your consciousness, or I don't know, to open up your consciousness. And that's not hard work? It's very hard. Okay. It's but inside. It, yeah, inside. Okay. Not outside. Yeah. So. In my experience, there is up to the 90% when uh, to reach that far. You have to work, you have to learn to write, you have to learn to get around in the world to, mm -hmm. to create your physical means to survive here. But I also experienced that when my consciousness and putting work into um, liberating myself of my wrong beliefs. Miraculously, things work around even quicker than uh, I would ever expect mm -hmm. uh, things to land in my reality. So 
I would like to invest more in, in this because... It's a good investment. I was thinking that I can go far with hard working, but I have a feeling that investing in the consciousness, it is such a transformation I cannot even imagine. It is the best investment. Yeah. And I, arriving at this point, my question is why the world is still here? Because they put their investment into the wrong place. If we yeah. invest in the mind, we get Zen shares. The Zen shares are publicly <laughs> floated in the universe and the yields are amazing. So no danger of shorts or bulls and bears, no problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Buddha himself just called this ignorance. So human ignorance is the problem. There is no external entity or entities that would define us or control us. It's a common misconception that we depend on externals so much that we cannot change ourselves fundamentally. We can, we always could, we always will be able to do this. Where do we put our investment, our energy? The biggest paradigmatic change for Buddha Shakyamuni was that in his time, 2,500 and some years ago, he changed his own worldview within Hinduism. He got the best education of Vedanta, of martial arts. He was the best of the best. And still something was missing. If you read the sutras, you can see it that yet this did not bring peace and happiness into my mind, Agivesana, whoever was the talking partner. So he kept searching, 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 and searching. And then something changed at a paradigmatic change, and he turned the energy inside, and he found his mind as the source that his ego originally does not exist. The personality is made of elements of body, feelings, impulses, <coughs> consciousness, willpower, etc., etc. Originally, no hindrance. Originally, no ignorance. But since we are attached to our own sensations, since we identify with our own thinking and our feelings, since we believe speech 100%, and that's how ignorance is created. So ignorance is basically creating illusions instead of sticking with reality. False self-image instead of attaining our true nature. Ideas about the world instead of perceiving cause and effect directly and clearly. So that's ignorance. Ignorance is not really the lack of information. Maybe it was like that some time ago. In this information age, if that was the reason, we would all be enlightened because we have, through the net, everything at our fingertips. Turns out ignorance is deeper than ever before. So ignorance is the wrong view, the wrong knowledge, the wrong information because it doesn't pertain to reality. That's the problem. So we invest in ignorance, the resulting greed and anger, instead of turning the energy inwards and asking the right question, what is this? What am I? What is this that sees through my eye, hears with my ears, feels with my heart, thinks with my mind? What is it that I call self? What is the bearer of this label, I? If we invested in that, our problems would have very different solutions. And how do you know that you have solved a problem that it does not reappear? It doesn't mutate. It doesn't come back in a different shape. When you solve the problem, it disappears for good. And another problem comes because you went one level up. Great. But we humans, for the last couple of thousand years, we've been around the same circles over and over again. As a group, as a species now counting 7.8 billion and up, we haven't solved our basic human problems. We just added to them, exacerbated them, made them worse because we invest in the wrong stock. So how much suffering do we need until we wake up and actually believe that this search that you described as the spiritual search is relevant, in fact, more important than anything else? We don't know that limit. But I think we are approaching that. More and more people are interested in how to change myself, how to understand myself, how to control myself, instead of controlling the world, changing the world, etc. There is no fixed limit. Most people have their own sense of survival, possession, and creation as their benchmark. 
If that's violated, something's wrong. And the Buddha started to teach. He, in fact, did not want to reveal most of what we are talking about right now. He said it's too radical. It's too simple. It's too deep. Then legend has it that the highest god, Brahma, from Tushita heaven, came and said, Lord, please initiate the teaching because there are people whose eyes are covered with just a thin layer of dust. They will understand. That was the beginning of the teaching. How thick is the dust before our eyes? How thick is the ego? That's the question. People who have very thick crust, they can scream, they can bleed, they can die, yet they would re totally refuse the paradigmatic change or the insight. And some people, it's enough. One little pinprick right away. <gasps> oh, it hurts. I'm suffering. Why? So immediately it goes inside. It totally depends on each and every one of us how thick this layer of dust is, how we can totally penetrate that. How thick is yours? Next question. I work with change transformations, so basically convincing people how to change so that the organization can change, which relates to what we're talking about. And what I've now started to do is I just work with the early adopters, which is what you're saying, the people who have a very little or small layer of dust, and then I don't focus on the people who are nine feet deep in terms of dust. But that's also because there's such a resistance to change, and I was wondering if you had like opinions on why there is such a resistance to change, because it can't be that everybody's just underneath mm. dust and they don't want to change. It must be deeper than that. We call that habit force. It's so strong that the Buddha likened it to children playing in the burning house. We are so much used to our own toys, internal and, ex and external toys, that we don't notice that the house is burning and we refuse to leave. When we acknowledge that, then we leave our own comfort zone and then we are open to transformation. And again, the early adopters or the more sensitive people smell the fire sooner. They can sense the heat sooner. But a society which wants to pride itself in high-tech and uh, systematic, predictable life takes away this sensation very quickly. So people are expecting that this will work for them, that the infrastructure will always support them, that the system is always trustworthy, and etc., etc. And then they themselves refuse to change because there's something seemingly immutable around them, something that cannot be touched. So I think the key here is to ask the right question. If you go deep enough, no one can really say for sure why they were born, what their purpose of life is. They can talk about responsibilities that they took upon themselves, from a dog to a spouse to children to cars to jobs to mortgage to house, whatever. But it's not your purpose. It's your condition. It's something you created for yourself together with others. But why do all this? Ultimately, why born into this body why live 70, 80 or so years and then die? What's the purpose? Now, this can go deep enough that people would actually go into a character-based crisis that they don't understand themselves. And then they might be open to change. Or if you want to make it more objective, you can ask, OK, you're here. What's troubling you? What's the problem? Because the other big paradox with these really well-established systems, hundreds of years of work in European society, that it's so, so frustrating and dissatisfactory in so many respects. So if we experience imperfection, interdependence, and impermanence, then why does that bother us? What's the problem that we are experiencing? So you can go subject-oriented, why were you born? Object-oriented, what's your problem? Either way, you will get results. And then people might be open to change. And if not, of course, plan B is always say, you don't have to change unless you want to. But if you suffer or make others suffer, remember, that's your homework that you haven't done. That's the karma you haven't perceived and dissolved or transformed. So my late teacher used to say, more suffering is necessary in this event, unfortunately. 
I would like to ask you about magnetism. Uh, I see a correlation between uh, how our world is arranging around ourselves and um, magnetism. So I do not see that much suffering what you're talking about. I'm sorry. I do not watch the television. I just Well, that's the problem. Uh, if uh, you just open the television, <laughs> it's already suffering independent of the content. But if you browse enough, you'll find suffering yeah, uh, but quite a bit. Yeah, but for example, I wanted to open the television to watch the news and it was not working. So I had this safety belt probably magnetically built around me and put in my reality. So I just didn't find out the bad news. Um, that's the question because I uh, also see that when I'm focusing on something, I am pulling toward myself. So if I'm focusing on pain, I'm pulling it to myself. Exactly, because you put energy into that yeah. and you don't put that much energy into something else. So this was my question, that how it is working? I think we can take uh, the unknowable part, like magnetism, out mm -hmm. and just work with the mind and its focus and its creation. Out of the infinite number of phenomena, your mind picks one. Like if you have a spouse or a boyfriend, from the potentially infinite number of males, you picked one. Or seemingly, you let him pick you. But the question is about the how. You start to talk to him and accept that he's talking with you. And this narrows down the focus to one person. Because during a date, you talk to your significant other, and that's it. You don't talk to anybody else, maybe the waiter. And that's it. That's how the focus changes. And the focus brings you more and more and more attention. It's an energy accumulation. And the funny thing is that whether it's a positive focus, desire, negative focus, fear, anger, resentment, it brings the object closer. That's the law of attraction. If you don't put any attention into something or someone, it passes. And as much attention as you put into it, whether it's a him, a her, or an it, whether the quality is seemingly positive or negative for you, it will always get closer. And the moment you stop paying attention, you stop putting energy into it, it starts to recede. It goes back to the normal flow of phenomena. It's so true that in Theravada, they have four levels of meditation because it happens inside the mind and also outside in the world. And those who see this stream of phenomena, it's called the stream enterers. In Sanskrit, the shrota apanna. Because they saw that inside the mind is the same as outside. The dharma for you and the dharma for the rest of the world is the same dharma, the same law, the same teaching of cause and effect. When you pick a thought or an emotion from your own stream and you put attention to it, then it becomes bigger, bigger, bigger. You pick someone from the world, then that friendship or enmity becomes bigger, bigger and bigger as you put more attention, more thought, more feelings, speech and action into it. You take that karma away, you dissolve the attention, you defocus, it goes back where it came from. That's how it works. Even after practicing a lot and studying, I still find that sometimes I'm very judgmental towards other people. Even if I try to tell myself, like, okay, everyone has Buddha nature. And while I tell myself that maybe this is not correct or I should not be using this or I should not be making these judgments, there are many situations where actually making these judgments, even if they are harsh, is advantageous for me, whether it be in work or just in who to stand behind in line while going through the airport. And, this you know, is airport, but this is <laughs> this is something that, you know, I I'm always a bit like, where do I find the balance? Because in one way, it gives you kind of some power and advantage. And in another way, you're, in a way, degrading and you're locking yourself up. So. Exactly. So, I give you the test. What color is this floor right here? Brown. Great. What color is the sky? Blue. Okay. 
Is the sky bad or good? Only that? Attached to one, you will lose your eyes. Is the floor good or bad? Just use your eyes. What do you see? The floor is brown. Correct. We practiced clear distinction. We have to see that the sky is blue and the floor is brown. But this clear, distinctive mind, as necessary as it is, to tell dirty from clean, when it goes into an overdrive, it becomes judgmental. Then we believe our distinctions are absolute, our theories to be infallible, and we judge characters instead of seeing them for who they are. If it underperforms, then we cannot tell dirty from clean, poisonous from healing. And that's a very serious problem too. That's why we have to house train dogs and teach children how to you know, dress correctly and use the toilet, etc., etc. So judgmental mind is the overdrive of distinctive or distinguishing mind. And the moment you notice that I am right and others are wrong, that's where you go into judgments. Smart minds have this problem a lot because they are right in terms of cause and effect, but to identify with that cleverness or insightfulness makes them judgmental very quickly. And judgmental mind alienates people. Clear distinctions don't. So see how you turn from relative to absolute, from distinguishing to discrimination. And in the short run, it can be very, very powerful. But in the long run, it comes back with a vengeance. Because judgmental people, very, very soon, they become isolated and lonely because nobody likes them. Nobody likes to be judged. It's OK to be different because nobody has the same face in this room, not even the same hairstyle in this room. So it's OK to be yourself, but to have another person just better than another based on identity, that's totally wrong. We are just who we are. In Zen, we call this suchness or thusness. We are like this. That's your face, that's your face, that's your face, that's your face. Everyone has different face. That's fine, but we are all humans. Thusness or suchness is seeing phenomena, people, all beings, this world, as we are. In our total disparity, distinguishing the sky from the floor, brown from blue, dirty from clean. We should see that very clearly. But to get rid of judgment or mind, we have to get rid of the absolute view. And the absolute view is the problem. And that's why in Zen, we come back before thinking, before any dualities. And when you hear this sound, there is no thinking. And based on that, your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. It's no thinking mind, has no views, no relative, no absolute. No something, no nothing. Just pa. And when your narrative is cut, when your karma suspends itself, you can return to our true nature. You can see clearly, hear clearly. Then the world is just like this. And the drum just says, boom. OK? That's what we need. That's why we teach the middle way, so that your distinguishing mind if you read the Compass of Zen, the seventh consciousness, that's your duality maker, that it wouldn't overperform and it wouldn't underperform. Big job. It takes a lot of fine tuning. More questions? Please I have, have a close. question actually linked to what Maya said, because I understand when you don't want to judge a person. But in fact, sometimes you have to judge actions of that people do exactly. in order to understand if a situation makes you suffering or not. Exactly. And, but then how you ignore, how you pull this away? You judge the action. You don't judge the person. Yes, but how you push this away? How I can ignore, for example, like uh, at work. Your you ignore boss your does own noise. Wrong for you. Very important. You ignore your own noise. Very good question. And you see facts. Yeah. 
So based on cause and effect, and of course the law and order of this world, you can see whether an action is acceptable or it has to be condemned. Some actions, they are bringing happiness. Some other actions bring suffering. And society has its own response for this. We judge the actions, or we have legal terms for it, or there's a sentence for it. There's no problem with that. But do not ever believe that that person is identical with it. That person is responsible for it, but not identical with it. Yes. I give you an example. You have a chocolate factory, Belgian chocolate. The factory has the freedom to choose what kind of chocolate it releases into the public, but it has also total responsibility for the quality. But the moment that the chocolate leaves the factory, it no longer is identifiable with it. It has clear links of responsibility, but you eat the chocolate and you don't eat the factory. So don't judge the person, judge the action, the speech, mm -hmm. okay? And then you are doing the right thing, giving that person a chance to better himself or herself, but being very clear about cause and effect. If that person caused deliberate harm, he or she is responsible and they have to pay for it, okay? But in ourselves, as a kind of originator of this karma, as much as we have the freedom to choose and the responsibility to bear, we are not identical with the product anymore. My question was, how can you like, push away this? Because sometimes you are like, stuck in a situation where you not actually ignore. Maybe it's just uh, your Ignore boss. your own noise, because this judgmental mind can go into an override, and then you have to see clearly what is my own idea and what is reality. And that's why we practice. That's why we meditate that we could distinguish from signal to noise, that's all. My question was actually very similar to yours. It was, I, I believe in finite energy, so I only have X amount of energy per day, so. Are you sure? If you eat another egg, that gives you more? No, I'm pretty sure. You are, okay. So what's your finite energy per day? How many kilowatts? I don't know, but I believe that I, let, let's say that I have 10 bars of energy and I can spend them on various amounts of tasks or people, but by, and I can exhaust them in different way. And so I can do things that give me energy or I can do things that spend and take energy. And this is also where the, where the judgment comes in is if, if I go spend time with, you know, one person at work or like this person is willing to change with me and we're working towards something that gives me energy. So I leave with more, whereas if I'm, working or facing somebody who we don't understand or the person, in my opinion, does not want to change, then it, I leave and I'm exhausted and I might as well go home and finish and do something else. It, it's difficult to judge or perceive, but sometimes like, even if it's based on facts, uh, this person is incompetent is a judgment. But if you've seen that this person is not on time, this person does not, you know, deliver subpar on these things, and then the result is the incompetence, even though it's based on facts? You didn't judge a person. Let's go back to thermodynamics first, because you said you have a finite amount of energy. Let's rephrase that into finite amount of time and space. Within that, your energy can change drastically within the hour. Somebody comes and makes you happy, you can go on for another day without eating and sleeping, okay? Somebody comes and totally exhausts you, you want to go to sleep at 3 p.m. So. It's finite, but it has huge margins because you are not isolated. If you were isolated totally from your environment, which you are not, none of us is, then this energy would be predictable. But go back to the basic laws of thermodynamics and you will see that neither a human nor any other phenomenon would be 100% isolated from its environment. It's impossible. So there's always some interaction. If there's interaction, the energy level can change radically. Now, going back to karma, if somebody is incompetent, it's very clear in what respects you see being on time, being fast with word processing, etc., etc. It's not judgmental to say somebody is incompetent relative to someone else. So person A, B, and C. You compare them, you see somebody is competent to the standards of the work that you need. Somebody is not competent. It's okay. But don't say that the incompetent is a bad person. That's where judgment would come in. 
Maybe the incompetent person is a wonderful company maker, a very good magnet for human interaction. And somebody who is very competent is so selfish, so efficient, so arrogant, that no one can work with him or her. Taking things relative, based on comparison, based on cause and effect, prevents you from being judgmental. Like I said earlier, if your views go absolute, watch out, because that's where judgmental mind comes in. If it's relative, if it's based on cause and effect, then it's valid, and you just made distinctions. You didn't pass judgments. Making baby steps in using my true own nature, I could resolve a lot of, of my issues, emotional, Focusing just, for example, on uh, being possessive towards someone or having an anger feeling or something. Focusing on that, I just observe it. It's Let's focus on <laughs> gone. Yeah. It's very good. In Buddhism, we call that emptiness. Yeah. But I don't like the word emptiness because it suggests a vacuum or nothing or something that we are afraid of, okay? But this gone is very good. Yeah. Say it again. Gone. gone. Wonderful. Just <laughs> it's a gone. Absolute beautiful feeling. So then something when, came. It, because a very bad feeling sometimes people mm -hmm. causing, and then you just focus. I'm feeling this, and then I observe it, and then it's gone. Eventually, this I is also gone. Yeah. That's another big baby step. <laughs> because the eye comes back. So you say this bad feeling is gone. Yeah, then yeah. beauty comes. Then beauty is also gone. Beauty is also Then oh, comes another go. beauty. Coming and going. Then another feeling, another thought, another... So this coming and going, remember what I said about mind is stream. So externally, the stream of phenomena, like this line of cars on the highway, it's the same thing outside and inside. This coming and going is natural. Us picking things out, taking directions, establishing relationships, committing to certain actions, that's also very natural. When this feeling of gone or liberation is there, that's our benchmark. When everything is gone, then you attain this point. That's why we use it. Then your dualistic thinking, dualistic feelings, dualistic speech, or strong, I, my, me, all gone. And then your mind is 100% clear. And our job is to keep that clear during our daily lives. So this original mind is called not moving mind. It has many, many designations, but originally it has no name and no form. But you can experience that. It's clear like space, clear like a mirror. And this mirror, we had better keep 100% clear. As you heard in the introductory from Maz, you know, you can have this habit of internal house cleaning and housekeeping on a day-to-day -day basis. Then you can handle life much, much better because as you lose your karma, you lose your kind of forced habits, then this mirror does not identify with the object before it. Very important. Imagine if the mirror would identify with the object, then the next object would not be reflected right away. So somebody writes a message on your bathroom mirror with a lipstick. It may be a wonderful message, but that's exactly where the mirror does not reflect. There's only the lipstick. That's it. If your mind is holding something, it's like a mirror. You look into it in the morning, and you come back in the evening, and the morning image is still there. What kind of mirror would that be? Wouldn't you freak out? When we practice, we practice this moment here and now to the fullest possible extent. That means we attain this clear like space, clear like mirror mind. And then these issues, they stop being problems. In fact, life becomes very rich and the problems become your helpers. Your burden becomes your asset. Sensory perceptions become your teachers instead of being illusions. It all depends on us. My second part of the question was that feeling this clearness and observation 
and using this in my everyday interaction with people, be having a point outside of myself, also observing myself and the other person, I get very tired. I did once for a full day and then I couldn't do it for a week. Because it happens here. Don't do that with your thinking. Then you get very tired. Totally relax. Just go back to this not moving mind and don't make anything. Then spontaneity and clarity, they pair up and you don't have to make this special effort. And that takes practice. That's why we focus on the Tantian. This Tantian is this not moving mind seat, okay? Your navel chakra. When we try to make the world better up here with the upper chakras, we get very tired because we are overstretching our thoughts, our speech, and our emotions. Did you notice that if you want to explain something too much, it doesn't work? Yes. Nobody understands it. Yes. After a while, we have to stop explaining. <laughs> Same thing with cognitive problems. You can overthink the problem so much that the solution totally disintegrates. With feelings, it's the most complex. You fumble around your emotional intelligence, then it has become so complicated that even your best friend or most beloved partner doesn't understand your feelings because they became so complex. That's why in Zen we focus here and empty the upper chakras out very naturally. And spontaneously whatever solution you need will appear seemingly from nowhere then also disappears seemingly nowhere. But we call this don't know, not nowhere. So we know. Before that, we didn't know. And after that, we don't know. And it's fine. It's OK like this. You're not missing anything. It's the way your consciousness and your subconscious can work together. Another question is that I feel myself in my head. Yeah. <laughs> so bring yourself down from your head to your belly, to your wonderful navel chakra, and that's why we hold the Mahamudra here. And then when you feel yourself here, then the upper chakras are relieved from the karmic burdens. Then you don't get exhausted because you're making things here and here and here. Thank you. You're welcome. You've been doing this for, for quite some time, I presume. Um, so what's your opinion on all of these new trends and new apps and, and new types of meditation? I don't know if it's new, but it's definitely becoming more industrialized, right? Yeah. So, yeah, just curious to kind of hear your stance on it. Opinions are such luxury that I cannot afford. They cost a lot. I think cause and effect are the best teachers. I think people should have the freedom to try whatever they believe in at first. And if they find that dissatisfactory, then they shouldn't pursue it. None of these things are good or bad by themselves. These phenomena are totally void of any qualities or characteristics. What is clear that for some minds, one way is suitable, and another way is not suitable. Variety is essential here. How did nature survive hundreds of millions of years? Because it multiplied, it adapted, so it evolved. I think spiritual tradition, whatever we call it, religions or paths or old age, new age, doesn't matter. We have enough variety so that we can adapt and learn so that we can evolve. And every mind should find something to believe in, to follow and to learn from. So I am very far from judging whether it's traditional, new age, Western, Oriental, it doesn't matter. Does it help you or not? That's the question. And if you say that it does, then find your teacher in it, identify the teaching in it, and find your peer group, the student's group, and then you're stable. But if you cannot see the teacher, cannot interact with him or her, you cannot identify the teaching, OK, this is this teaching that I'm learning, and you don't find others who are practicing or studying with you, then something is missing. In our genre, we call this the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha is the individual, the teacher, and also the better version of the teacher. The Dharma is the teaching, and the Sangha is the student's group. 
So these are the three essential elements that you should find in anything that you try, because then it's traceable, can then it's identifiable, then you can work with it. Can you please elaborate a little bit on the second one, the middle one? The, the Dharma, teaching? okay. The Dharma literally means the law, the law of cause and effect. And to make it even more interesting, in Sanskrit, Dharma also means phenomenon, all dharmas or phenomena. But it also means the law that governs the interaction of all phenomena together. That's amazing because the general and the particular, they're not different in this usage. In Hinduism, there is the term sanatana dharma, which is the eternal teaching, the law that doesn't change. As long as there is this observable universe, it will be directed and governed by laws, including us humans, whether it's a psychological or external physical law, we cannot escape that. So it's just the way things operate, whether inside, outside, individual or collective. That's the Dharma. And if you don't understand the Dharma, you cannot control karma. Because karma is habits, the repetition of habits, the accumulation of habits, the identification with habits, the notion of individual, couple, family, and group all together, that's karma. If you want to understand what we are, how we form our relationships, we have to understand the Dharma. What are the laws that govern us, all of us, that is not dependent on opinion, culture, language, creed, race, i.e., it doesn't depend on any ideas. It's the unwritten law, which can be also written down partially, never fully. But if we don't understand the Dharma, we cannot control karma. And if we look at this world very carefully, reverse the equation, and if you find uh, unresolved suffering, that means we didn't see some karma clearly. We didn't understand the Dharma that controls that karma. Therefore, we didn't change that. We didn't change ourselves. We didn't change our family culture, our social culture, our identity as a group and an individual. We are unaware of that, or we have wrong ideas about that. So the karma, the habits control us because we haven't discovered the dharma. We haven't seen the laws that govern us and this world sufficiently. That's why the dharma is very important. Now, in the West, many times we identify the dharma with these books, the written scriptures. And that's partially true, only partially true. We have to find a true dharma that does not depend on words and speech. The life cause and effect insight in ourselves and the person next to us and the entire world. Then we can make wise and compassionate decisions. Then we do not have to create suffering. Then happiness and love and kindness, they all naturally appear because we removed the hindrances. So I hope that from time to time we can gather here or other wonderful Dharma locations and uh, share the Buddha's teaching so that we could gain insight into the nature of our own existence, attain awakening, and save all beings from suffering, including ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention.